Fountainhead. <laughs> trying to think about how long it's been since I said I was going to do a review of this. The last book I do remember reading was Ein's first in We the Living. As you can tell, this one is a fair bit longer. So ordinarily with these reviews, I like to try to write a bit of a script to try to keep summarize everything that needs to be summarized. However, I found that part one of the summary script ended up being longer than the At The Shrugged comparison videos. So this time it's going to be a little more off the cuff, so to speak. As such, this review is going to be a lot more vague than most of my other reviews. What is the story? That is what I find rather interesting about it. Much like how At The Shrugged is and the idea that it bounces around from perspective to perspective, this is very much the same way. Our two main characters for the first part of the book are Peter Keating and Howard Rourke, both of which want to be architects, but have very different ways of going about it. So Peter Keating's method is to agree with everybody, and he needs to have constant praise whenever possible. That's the main reason he wanted to go into architecture in the first place. Well, Howard Rourke will do it his way, and only his way. As such, Howard Rourke is then kicked out of college, while Peter Keating is able to go on to bigger and better things, landing a partnership with a very big architectural firm known as Franken and Heller, I believe. Rourke, however, works for another architect known as Henry Cameron. Very similar to Rourke in many respects, in the idea that if they're going to design a building, they will only do it their way, and their way only. No compromises, no middle of the roads. Just their way, or the highway. However, Henry Cameron's health doesn't hold out for very long, and eventually has to close down the architectural firm. In his degrading condition, Rourke would be one of the few people allowed to see him in this dying state. Before passing on to the great beyond, he simply says, Do you really want to live the life that I do? I fought all my life, and look at where it's got me. A bankrupt architectural firm, and nothing to show for it. Howard Rourke gladly accepts the challenge, and stays with it. We then switch back to Peter Keating, who, like I mentioned before, has a partnership with a really big architectural firm. How this is done, though, is actually a little seedy. So, the company was Franken and Heller. Heller, much like Cameron, was degrading in his older age, and really he was just there for publicity, if nothing else. Peter tries to urge him to retire, but the old man just refuses to do so. So, he has a stroke one day, and he goes off to his mansion to see how he's doing. Seeing that he still wants to keep going, Peter Keating gets really angry at him, and thus triggering the second stroke that kills him. Peter is happy that he gets the partnership, but at the same time he still kind of has that little bit of guilt in the idea that he was the one that killed and then took over the partnership of the company. And then on top of that, this other partner actually left him a substantial amount of money from his estate. Having no heirs or anybody that really cared for him, he left all his property to Peter Keating. This new responsibility, he just keeps going up and up. Well, Howard Rourke, on the other hand, is just struggling to find a customer that is able to take his particular set of skills. There are a few, one of them known as Austin Heller. I believe I got the name mixed up. But either way, all you need to know is that Franken had a partnership with another guy that's not around very often. Austin Heller, a rather eccentric billionaire who wanted a house to be only his and nobody else's. At this point, Howard Rourke found another architectural firm that was willing to keep him on as a modernist consultant. His job abruptly ends with that Heller house, though. Essentially, Howard Rourke designed the perfect house for him, 
But everybody at the architectural firm says, Nah, this isn't very pretty. We better do a few things here and there to dress it up a little bit. And so when they showed the drawing to Austin Heller, he looks at it and he goes, mm, It's really close to what I want, but there's just something not right about it. Howard Rourke can't stand it anymore. He immediately goes up to the drawing and starts drawing in the original plans. The head of this architectural firm is furious and is about to stop him when Austin Heller says, No, I'm going to see what he's doing. He finishes the drawing, to which the head of the architectural firm says, Rourke, you are fired. To which Austin Heller replies, Then I am fired too. And then they go off together to talk about the details of the house. He puts down the money for it, and the house is put up just as Howard Rourke intended it. It has become the laughing stock of the neighborhood. The only people that drive by to look at it are those looking at the crazy booby hatchery that's over there, and just being all around disrespectful to Howard Rourke as well as Austin Heller. This job actually helped out a little bit because there was one person that drove by who wanted to make a service station which was just as otherworldly as this other house was. That was Howard Warp's second commission. He has quite a fair bit of money to be able to survive for a while. The only problem is this money dries up when all he is left with one final customer. A bank who wants to have his drawings. However, his drawings have to be approved by a committee and, well, I think you can see where this is going. They want to slightly tweak Rook's plans, to which he just says, forget it, I'm dropping the contract. This forces him to close his doors on his new architectural firm, and instead he goes to work for a quarry. Now, one other thing I forgot to mention as well. So before going to the quarry, there is this competition going around for what's known as the Cosmo Slockton building. Essentially, these are big movie producers that wanted to have a very unique theater. A raffle is being drawn, and whoever submits the best drawing is the one that will get all the notoriety, as well as the commission to build the building. Peter Keating goes over to Howard Work to see what his idea on the building is. Rourke doesn't care. He does not want to be part of this competition. However, he is nice enough to offer a few plans up to Keating, which Keating adapts to his own nature and makes it his own. Keating feeling a little guilty that he basically stole the plans to the Cosmos Lockton building attempts to buy off Howard Rourke. He recognizes the nature of the bribe and quickly says, keep your money. I do not want to be associated with this building whatsoever. And so Keating is given free reign, but once again with a little twinge of guilt, very similar to when he killed Franken's partner. Cosmos locked in building. Howard Rourke's design is picked, and Peter Keating, as well as the architectural firm he's working for, gets a substantial boost. In fact, they can barely keep up with any orders. Well, we have Howard Rourke, who is closing his business to go work for a quarry. He still needs to live, so he still needs a job. It is very hard work. He is there day after day, jackhammering. He's sweaty. He's tired. But at the same time, he kind of likes the job, because he doesn't owe himself to anyone. Only himself. But before going into the quarry, we are introduced to Franken's daughter, who is... Considered rather weird, and in all honesty, it seemed like a perfect fit for Howard Rourke. Very similar to the idea that they know what they want, and they're going to do whatever they can to get it. And they don't care what happens in the process. It is actually her father that owns the quarry that Howard Rourke works for. During the summer times, she would often go up there just to kind of relax and take a break from the hustle and bustle of the city. One time, the blasting of the quarry gets a little too much for her, and she wants to see what is going on when she eyes Howard Rourke. It's hard to say if it's really love at first sight. It's more like 
he can control her, so to speak, by just looking at her in such a right way. There is a bit of back and forth between Dominique and Howard, but none of them really plan to do a whole lot. Dominique is the one to make the first move. She destroys part of the banister to her fireplace, which is made out of solid granite, as an excuse to get Howard Rourke over to her place. This works. Howard arrives, and he's able to get the estimates for the limestone that would be mined from the quarry. She then specifically asks that it is Howard that put in this stone. However, Howard pulls a bit of a joke on her and sends somebody else in his place. Dominique is furious and goes down to the quarry wondering, why did you do this to me? To which Howard just kind of says, because I can. It just kind of establishes their relationship. Now, what happens next? Seems something that would be out of Fifty Shades of Grey. Without getting too gruesome into the details, because, wow, they go into a lot of details about this. Essentially, Howard goes over to Dominique's house and, uh, makes passionate love to her. I still really can't tell if this is a rape scene or not, because she hates the idea of wanting it. She wants it because she hates it. I don't know what to think about this. But I'm pretty sure by the classical definition, there was no consent at all, and he just... Right on. <laughs> and, uh, wow. The main reason I find this rather shocking is that I've seen a lot of lists of banned books throughout the ages. Fahrenheit 451 for just being a little too extreme, Animal Farm for promoting socialism, The Grapes of Wrath for sympathizing with migrant farmers, other stupid things like that. And yet this book was not on the list even though it has a really intense rape scene, as well as very foul language. That's perfectly fine. But don't say the N-word, otherwise we'll let the ban Huckleberry Finn. But enough of that censoring book rant. After that, uh, evening, <laughs> Howard is given another commission by another odd millionaire who wants a very specific house by this very specific architect. Unfortunately, there is a little bit of compromising here, as this millionaire is not the only one living in the house. It eventually gets to a point where the house is built with several compromises, and only one person is crazy enough to live into it. The Enright House, I believe it's called. There's one other character I forgot to mention as well. A one Ellsworth Tuohy. I hope that's how you're supposed to pronounce the name because, wow, that is a really odd name. He is a self-proclaimed critic on architecture. But what's interesting is as you go along further in the book, you find that he has this underlying motive to eventually take over the newspaper that he works for, known as the Banner. The Banner itself is pretty much a tabloid, so to speak. The owner of it, a one Gail Wainyard, essentially gives the people what they want. Sex. Abuse. Poverty. The worst of all humanity. This is the stuff that people do not want to admit that they want, but they actually do. And as such, they make a lot of money with it. Miss Ellsworth Tohey wants to take over the entire paper, as well as every mind of every person in the world. <laughs> now, his plan is honestly kind of scary in the idea of how it seems to match up with what's currently going on now in American politics. But the basic idea is that he uses what he calls the power of nonsense. The basic idea is that you tell people that the biggest garbage, the worst literature, the worst plays, the worst movies, the worst stuff possible 
is actually cultural brain food. And if you don't like it, then you're not smart enough to be able to, be able to enjoy such a deep and thorough experience. On top of this, he'd made friends with several people that he calls replaceable. All the Peter Keatings of the world, those that just agree with everything and everyone. Very inoffensive, but yet can be easily replaced by anyone off the street. So that's Ellsworth Tony. Let's see, where were we in the story? Bounce back to Howard Rourke, who is offered one more commission known as the Stoddard Temple. Essentially another crazed millionaire who wants to make a temple to the human spirit. Knowing everything else we're told about Rourke, this seems perfect. Tohi, though, is the one that's convincing Stoddard to go along with Howard Rourke in the first place. According to the contract, Howard is given full reign to be able to do whatever he wants. As such, this is the main commission that he works on, night and day. He hires a sculptor known as Steve Mallory. Now, Mallory is a rather controversial figure, as he tried to take a shot at Ellsworth Tohe a while ago, but was later acquitted for lack of evidence. After that, his sculptures just kind of went downhill, but Howard Rourke wanted him specifically. He made a statue for the Cosmos Lockton building from earlier that really had the theme that Howard Rourke wanted to say predominantly in this temple to the human spirit. It took a lot of convincing on Howard Rourke's part to be able to have him do it, and he does. The model for the statue is Dominique Franken, which to the chagrin of her father. Now what's rather interesting about the statue is that uh, it's nude, and the father says, I can't stop you, but what am I going to do about it? To which she says, Order a replica. It's going to be beautiful. What father in their right mind would want a reproduction of their nude daughter? D don't answer that. I, I don't want to know the answer if there is anybody out there. Don't tell me. It take a while trying to figure out just the right pose when, when Dominique comes up with one, and that is the final addition to the statue. So... Stoddard gave Howard Rourke full reign to do whatever he wanted with the temple. In the meantime, Stoddard was going to be touring around the world looking at all the other great temples, just to get an idea of what this one would look like. He goes through it, and he is rather speechless, as it's very different to any other temple he ever saw before. However, Ellsworth kind of jumps into his mind a little bit, and convinces him this is not a temple to the human spirit, but a temple to Howard Rourke. He is a very selfish man, and this is anti-religious. As such, Stoddard attempts to sue Howard Rourke for damages. Ellsworth is able to come up with a whole bunch of witnesses, part of his gang of replaceable people, as I mentioned earlier. All of them telling how this is a fallacy on the art of the great work of architecture, since architects are supposed to be servants of their clients, rather than the clients being servants to the architect. As well as just the idea that it goes against every single classical religious temple out there as well. Work represents himself in this case, and does not ask anything of any of the witnesses. The only standout in this trial is Peter Keating's testimony. He obviously comes in drunk, and eventually you start to realize he's going off script, basically saying, Why can't I be able to be independent? Why can't I do whatever I want? To which the prosecutor is just like, What does this have to do with the case? I don't know, just screw this whole enterprise, I can't stand it. Hard work ends his case with just 12 fantastic photos of the temple itself, to which the judge and the jury just says, no, you have to do this temple the right way, to which he has to give up all his money that he was paid in order to make the temple to fix the temple. 
which, depending on your perspective, defacing the temple. Ellsworth Tohe goes into the description of this. The idea that he wanted to kill Howard Rourke's career because he was an independent thinker. He wants only people that all share the same brain, the same thought processes, the same motives, everything. And this was his way of killing his career. The idea that it would kind of blow out in a year, the idea that in a year's time nobody would probably remember this story. But at that point, nobody, re nobody would remember Howard Rourke either. And that was quite a stroke of genius on Ellsworth's part. The idea that in a year's time nobody would probably remember this story. But at that point, nobody would remember Howard Rourke either. No denying, that was a very devastating blow to Rourke's career. But he is able to pick up a few commissions here and there. Which is to say a lot more than the other architects in this book. Now, unlike At the Shrug, which takes place in maybe about a three year span, this one takes place during about a 20 year span. Starting in 1920 and ending in the 1940s. So obviously the Depression takes a huge hit on the entire profession of architecture. But Howard Rourke is able to find a few various odd jobs here and there, making houses, chicken coops, fences, very menial jobs, but just enough to be able to stay afloat, as well as kind of relevant. His big break comes up later with a bit of a scheme that was going on. So essentially these group of investors sought out Rourke in order to create a great summer resort in a valley that nobody has ever heard of. Rourke, still rather sore from the starter temple fiasco, requests that every design be approved by everybody on the board, which reluctantly everything is approved of and Rourke is given free reign to do the entire valley. The valley ends up being, being an amazing success. Everybody loves it, and you can barely find room in this summer resort whatsoever. However, what comes out of it is very interesting. This was a big scheme. Essentially, these group of investors were con artists. They wanted to hire the worst architect possible, so that way they would take everybody's money to fund this, and then they'd disappear when all of a sudden the company went mysteriously bankrupt. However, now that this summer resort actually started making money, they actually had to pay all their investors back. Three times more than they thought they were going to. There's a big trial about it, but this does not deny the ability of Howard Rourke's work. Peter Keating, by this time, is the sole proprietor of his architectural firm. Franken had to retire. He was getting old, and he just simply had enough of the business. His company was going downhill fast. There was very few commissions, and very few people wanted to do anything. His last chance is a housing development known as Cortland. It's a government-run commission, but if it was successful, it would seal a whole bunch more government contracts, and thus they would be able to make a ton of money. Once again, Peter Keating asks for Rourke's advice. Now, the interesting thing to note is Peter Keating, as well as the company, really let go. Peter gained about 30 pounds and about 15 years of age. Well, Howard Rourke looks exactly the same, to which Peter is a little jealous of this. But after a little back and forth, Howard does give him an idea of how to make this Cortland housing. The main thing is, it has to be done his way, and only his way. If there's any altercations, you deny it. It seems everything goes well. When all of a sudden, there were three or four minor adjustments. Peter Keating was not the sole person on the project. Ellsworth claims, you can't hog all this for yourself, you gotta give it to other people. And in other parts, it's also made very obvious that Ellsworth is a hard socialist, so this goes in line with his beliefs as well. Howard Rourke can't stand this, later plans a conspiracy with Dominique in order to destroy this horrible building. However, the interesting part of the plan is that it had to be very obvious that Rourke got caught doing this. 
there is a huge scandal and a huge lawsuit that goes with it. Much like the Stoddard Temple, the jury was ready to hang him just because of his smug confidence as he went in there. However, he makes a really good case for it. He gives the speech of the century. It kind of reminds me a lot of Reardon's speech from Adler Shrugged in the way that it's not only very convincing, but you can kind of see Ayn's philosophy sneaking in there as well. He makes the great argument, and he wins the lawsuit. Now at this point it was very much built up that Ellsworth Tohey was in control. The paper that Gail Wanyard owned, the banner, was going to pieces because he was in full support of Howard Rourke. Nobody wanted any part of him. There was horrible strikes. People that were willing to work were either horrible at it or only showed up every so often. The paper was going downhill fast and Ellsworth was using this plan in order to get a newspaper of his own and thus brainwash the entire country. This trial upset his plans completely. Now with this, Howard is immediately the hero of the country. Everybody starts to realize that, you know, this Ellsworth, maybe he can't be trusted. He seems to be causing riots because of people disagreeing with him. He has caused a great number of disturbances. Businesses being destroyed. Once again, this sounds a little too close to modern times for my liking. The book ends with one last commission. Gail Wainyard has always had a dream of creating his own building in the slums that he grew up in known as Hell's Kitchen. He bought the entire land years ago, but could never really could find when the best time to create this building would have been. After this lawsuit and the Wainyard paper essentially being exonerated along with Rourke, takes this as the opportunity. The building is created. The building is basically a skeleton now, but it is planned to be the tallest and the grandest building in New York City. The world probably doesn't want it anymore as everybody's going to subsidized housing. Ellsworth Tohey is not out of the woods just yet. He finds another newspaper and slowly tries to take over just like he did with Wayne's paper. And the book ends with a beautiful picture of the outside. Now it could be me, but I'd like to think that this front picture by Frank O'Connor, Ein's husband, is supposed to be the Wainwood building. That is the Fountainhead. You'd be surprised how much I condense this. One of the other major things to mention is that Dominique bounced around with a lot of men. She ends up marrying Peter Keating because she couldn't stand the sacrificed herself to the temple and she just kind of gave up on doing anything special anymore so she surrendered herself to a life of mediocrity with me peter keating however afterwards she then marries gail wainyard who essentially has the same standards as brooke does but there is a little difference here and there the major thing is wainyard being about 20 years older than dominique is <laughs> And then after the suit, Dominique eventually marries the one she is meant to be with, Howard Rourke, by the end of the book. There was also a lot more description as to the origin story of Ellsworth Tohey, as well as Gail Wanyard and his famous newspaper. Now here's the thing I find the most interesting about the book. There's not really a set villain or hero. It's all just conflicting philosophies. If you're with Howard Rourke in the individualist philosophy, then you would see Ellsworth Tohey as the great villain of the book. If you're with the altruist mentality, then you would see Peter Keating as the hero and Gail Wainyard as the villain. And that I find very interesting. You never really hear about a subjective villain. I have never seen that done in any other form of literature. Sure, I've seen twist villains. A lot have been done horribly. But the idea that you can pick your own heroes and villains, just kind of like in life itself, that is very unique. Now, if I were to compare the two, Ed the Shrugged and the Fountainhead, I am a bigger fan of Ed the Shrugged. The main difference being 
The Fountainhead is character-based, while Atlas Shrugged is more story-based. I don't know what it was. I didn't regret my time reading Fountainhead, but there was times I just couldn't bring myself to actually start reading it. There were so many times I was just kind of like, eh, I'm tired, I'm going to do something else. Well, when it came to add the Shrugged, I was hooked. <laughs> I will admit, the final part of the Fountainhead, part four, that one stuck to my attention and went by the fastest. I still find it crazy. Every so often I would kind of write little notes on my bookmark about things I wanted to quote or things I wanted to remember. And there was times I would look down there and I'd just be like, huh, I wrote page 537 this morning and I'm on page 600. Part 4 kept my attention. It is story driven and it is by far the most intense. It seemed very much poised that Howard Rourke was not going to win this lawsuit. And to me, I just did not want Ellsworth to win. <laughs> the idea that mediocrity being king, rather than the individualist. But I think that just kind of goes into my personal philosophy as well. Would I recommend it? <laughs> well, I'd say yes. There is a ton of philosophy in here. There is a lot of very unique and interesting characters to this. Not to say that they weren't any at the shrugged, but I don't know. There was just something a bit more thought-provoking about these characters. The ones that followed blindly Ellsworth Tohey, and the ones that just wanted to be individuals, to be their own selves, to not be ruled by anyone. And that I find to be the main selling point of this book. But one thing I can tell you right now is despite the obvious size difference, I am fairly certain that the Fountainhead is longer than at the Shrug is. And hey, the speeches in this one are kind of long, but nothing compared to the monotonous John Kelt speech. There is only one major problem I have. It seems like any other book I read after this is going to not seem worth my time anymore. There was just so much here that it's just going to seem so bland compared to reading any other books. I will admit I probably could have chose a better follow-up book, but I just like to read the classics, and I wanted to know why this one was considered classic. The Wind and the Willows. I'm about two chapters in. It's not that it's a bad book, it's just, I'm wondering, who's the audience here? Is this meant more for grown-ups or for little kids? Not to say there's anything wrong with that, it's just, after finishing up The Fountainhead, this just isn't really that much of a follow-up. But at the same time, it is kind of nice to be able to decompress. Even if it is going from Lawrence of Arabia to Disney's Aladdin. This one is probably going to go by a lot quicker because not only is it a much shorter story, but I feel like there's going to be a lot less spots where I'm going to be like, that is really interesting. I wonder what the character is actually thinking about. It's going to be a lot more obvious. But let's not brush this book before I actually read it. After all, I mean, I'm comparing this to probably the most thought-provoking work I have ever read. Everything else is going to seem like total garbage after this. <laughs> so, if you're interested, maybe I'll do a review of The Wind of the Willows once I'm done with it. Until next time, keep having fun.